So our talk is going to be about consumerization of healthcare and uh, what we're doing at Kaiser Permanente and Cloud Foundry. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some problems as well. But first, uh, we'll do the quick round of introductions here. So Surya, go for it. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Surya Degarla. I'm from IBM, uh, SDSM for uh, uh, One Cloud Architecture. Uh, with me, um, Alex. Alex Rubin. I'm a principal architect uh, at Kaiser Permanente. And, uh, Part of my daily duties is to work with different teams across, across KP to uh, talk to them about uh, the capabilities that we have on the platform, the services that we have on the platform, how to utilize those services, best practices around microservice application design, um, and then also to kind of learn a little bit as the teams are progressing, as they're taking their applications from you know, POC all the way through the development and go into production to learn kind of uh, where they stumble, what are some of the issues, so we can augment best practices and we can look for tools and capabilities that will address some of those areas. So then we'll, you know, we'll take all of that knowledge and we'll wrap it back up and uh, give it to teams to help them run better and faster. Yeah, with that, uh, today we're going to talk about healthcare in general, uh, how Cloud Foundry is being used in healthcare industry and why you need cloud in healthcare. Um, and we'll talk about, as Alex mentioned, um, the KP's experiences running on Cloud Foundry, uh, what exactly worked well, what didn't work um, pretty well with uh, you know, RX application or many um, healthcare applications. Um, so then um, we will talk about what we did um, to make these applications perform better, scale better, and then work better. Um, and of course, we still have a few other things that are um, open items for the community. So we're going to talk about uh, some of those things. And um, that's how um, we're going to spend the next 30 minutes um, here. So um, healthcare and cloud, right? As uh, some of you might have seen, um, uh, I was talking about uh, banking on Cloud Foundry. Um, now, uh, how about healthcare industry? Um, so you can see there are multiple issues uh, with the healthcare application, uh, healthcare industry applications. Um, the cloud is actually trying to solve. Uh, for instance, uh, cost um, is one of the considerations for some of the uh, reasons why in healthcare applications that actually healthcare industry is actually looking at cloud. Um, that's not all, that's one of the factors, but you can uh, look at uh, the digital disruption and, uh, um, and the multi-speed IT because the, the speed at which um, you can actually deliver uh, the latest features and uh, the requirements that the consumers are actually looking for. Uh, that's the second one, and of course the third uh, is the agility and embracing the, um, the kind of different business models. So I will let uh, um, Alex talk about the reasons why KP uh, chose to go to cloud and, and uh, select Cloud Foundry. Um, Alex? Yep, thanks. Get a clicker from you. All right, so um, Kaiser Permanente is digital journey. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, kind of where we are, where we started, and where we're going, and some of the problems that we've hit. So first of all, can I get a show of hands? Who knows what, who Kaiser Permanente is? Anybody? No? OK, pretty good. OK, great. So for those folks who may not be aware, Kaiser Permanente is one of the you know, top 10 largest integrated healthcare providers in the United States. Uh, we operate uh, 39 hospitals. We have over 670 different medical offices and outpatient facilities. Um, and uh, 200,000 plus employees in, in the family and 11.8 uh, million members altogether. So lots of, lots of members that we're serving and a pretty big company. Uh, we've been around for 70 plus years. So there's legacy applications as well as the new microservice applications that we'll talk about here. Uh, but one of the key things for us is kind of this whole idea that uh, as you know, folks, as consumers, as individuals, we like to be engaged with um, in different ways, right? So there's many different things that uh, we prefer. We prefer to be connected via different devices, so maybe co communicating via cell phones or social media. Um, you know, we have uh, all of the IoT devices around too, so for folks who may be looking at um, uh, after hospital stays, how do you improve the overall quality, right? You may be, you know, deciding that it's better for you to recover at home. And uh, consequently, that also happens to be a cheaper alternative, right, than for you to stay in the hospital. 
um, you know, taking care of um, some of the uh, chronic conditions, it's also better done, uh, you know, if you have devices that are helping you uh, manage those conditions. So there's lots of opportunities, right? And, and even for things like, you know, uh, farmer's markets in the community and being able to go and know where to go uh, for a farmer's market uh, or, um, you know, being able to uh, connect to your doctor in the way that's easier for you. Uh, and maybe that doesn't include going to the hospital. Maybe it includes doing an electronic visit and just seeing your doctor over a video chat and, and asking questions. Uh, you know, that's prefer all of these are preferred ways, right, for us. But they're also, in the end, making healthcare cheaper for, for everyone, right? Because if you don't show up at the hospital, th things just get a lot simpler. So uh, with that in mind, in order for us to build all kinds of experiences and applications that enable you to connect in all these different ways and give you value as members and as employees in all these different ways, we need to create a digital platform, digital foundation, where we can start building some of these components and we can start delivering some of that, some of that value, right? We don't want to be rebuilding continuously uh, the same capabilities. We want to innovate and that means that you have to have a layer which you can use to kind of allow developers to very quickly uh, deploy applications, to utilize different services. So, you know, fail fast kind of mentality, right? So you, you, you want to create an app, you want to use a SQL DB. Well, you tried it, you know, maybe you got some feedback from users, you have to change your data model. So now you're going to go and use a, a NoSQL DB. How can we do that very quickly? I just want to be able to spin it up and go, right? I don't want to have to wait for you know, a few weeks to stand up one of those databases and then try to haggle around who's going to maintain that database and upgrade those servers, et cetera, et cetera, right? So from a cost perspective, that's very expensive and gets very laborious. So what we wanted is we wanted a platform where we can really uh, leverage all of these capabilities, not just from the runtime perspective, but also from a service perspective. And uh, we picked uh, IBM Cloud, IBM Dedicated Cloud, as, as the platform for us. And, and so we've, um, we've adopted that, and over the last few years, we've been kind of developing and integrating uh, all the different capabilities so that we can deliver value. So just providing a platform is not enough, though, right? As I mentioned, we're over 70 years old, and that implies that we do have a lot of systems of record and a lot of you know, COTS products um, as any large enterprise, right? Uh, nothing ever really goes away, it just gets, you know, added to. And so, you know, in order to provide and deliver value to the, our members, we have to be contextual, and we really have to know, uh, and some of the background and history around how some of these um, things have developed. And so, we need to be able to access backend systems of record, which also means then that we have to tie everything together, and we can't just look at, you know, a brand new application, Greenfield in the cloud, you, you, you develop and that's it, and it runs in isolation. It means you have to have, you know, the integration, full-fledged integration with your systems of record, and you have to be able to track transactions, you have to be able to look at logs holistically, you have to be able to, you know, set up CI-CD pipelines for your deployments, uh, and also think about how the versions play together and integration happens. So there's a lot going on uh, in, in, in really operationalizing something like this, right? Um, so once we were able to integrate uh, cloud, uh, cloud Foundry and, uh, in this case, IBM Cloud into our enterprise a little bit better, we were more comfortable running different applications on it. We started out with just doing workforce applications, and then um, now we're you know, looking at more complex applications which are member-facing. And so um, as part of that, um, we have a kp.org, which is one of our premier ways that uh, members can connect with us. It's a premier member-facing site. Millions of users coming to the site day in and day out to do all kinds of different things, uh, from you know, scheduling an appointment, sending a message to your doctor, refilling your prescriptions, you know, all kinds of capabilities, right? And what we wanted to do is, you know, originally this application was a monolithic app that was running on WAS. Uh, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to refactor this application and uh, take it into microservice world and uh, be able to, you know, provide better, better experiences to our users, uh, allow teams to decouple from each other and really run fast, owning different aspects of this, and, and be, able to, be able to integrate together in the end to provide kind of a holistic experience, right? So, as part of that, what we started doing is we started kind of building out these capabilities and brought in integration to the enterprise. So kind of what you see here is at the top is kind of what users do and uh, what their experience is. And in this box here, you see that we have uh, KP data centers. And this is the IBM Cloud. And you can see basically some of the microservices that are running in IBM Cloud. 
So at the high level, you basically have a user. The user might you know, authenticate against some on-prem system. Then they get this kind of like uh, welcome screen, and they can decide uh, where to proceed from there. So they may select, let's say, a pharmacy application or some other application. And um, you know, they, they will get uh, static content sort of from uh, AM. We're using AM for our um, content management system. Uh, and then the dynamic content would, would come from the microservices that are sitting over here in IBM Cloud. And what typically happens is there will be a request that goes into a microservices tier here, and that microservices tier will be comp comprised of um, maybe a gateway written in Node.js, and we'll have some business microservices written in Java. So it's polyglot, uh, and you, some of these will actually send requests to the backend systems of record, uh, maybe to electronic medical record or to other systems of record to, to be able to fetch the data and provide you with relevant information that you really care about. Um, and then those requests will be processed here and then sent back. Uh, we're also using a, a bunch of different services, so this just shows you a few, but you know, in addition to that, we're, we have object storage, push notifications, Postgres, a, a whole bunch of other ones, right? So this is just an example with a few. And, and um, so then you can build out these, these complex systems. Now, when you have something like this, it kind of looks easy on the slide, right? Not a lot of components, but uh, it's a simplified slide. There's, there's a lot to it, and you really do have to th start thinking about you know, how are we gonna have different teams running and building out you know, all these different capabilities? How is this all gonna fit together? How is the platform gonna hold up? Um, you know, how is the performance going to be, right? So you want to optimize a lot of these things. So Next step, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a few challenges that we've hit all, along the way, right? Not everything was absolutely perfect at all times. And um, some of these challenges um, were interesting. So, and then what I'll do is I'll pass it over to Surya to talk about some of the kind of lessons learned and best practices and you know, kind of how we're working together to address this and also where the community can, can help us with some of these issues. So one of, the, one of the things that we had um, an interesting problem with is uh, multi-tenancy. So basically, we have multiple Cloud Foundry environments that we're running in, and one of our environments is a dev environment where lots of people are deploying code. And so what happened is you know, we have some projects, as I mentioned early on, they're like in POC stage, so they'll just do sandbox, they'll deploy from their laptop, you know, they'll push some sample apps or do some tech POCs to see if certain frameworks run and how fast they run, et cetera. Uh, we'll have other teams that are going to be going through a standard you know, pipeline from dev to QA to UAT, et cetera, right? So you might have somebody running standard set of tests in QA, UAT, uh, just checking the functionality. And you'll have other teams that are going to be running performance testing, and they're just going to be pushing their apps to try to see, hey, how much can I squeeze out of this app in terms of transactions? Am I fine? You know, where do I need to go patch? Where, what do I need to go optimize in terms of my application capabilities and how fast they run, right? And so what we found is, um, at one point uh, in, our, in that environment, we saw like this behavior where and this, this kind of shows you um, IBM Cloud dashboard that kind of gives you a highlight of what your resources are doing at the high level. And you can see there's a bunch of Diego cells here, and you can see that a bunch of these Diego cells are kind of pegged at like 100% CPU. And there were a, like literally like most of them in the environment were pegged at 100% CPU, so that was a little bit problematic. And you can see kind of all, all the behavior in the platform here showing kind of uh, this 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 bad behavior. So that was that was kind of fun. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later in the talk of kind of what happened and how we addressed some of this. Um, suffice it to say, we should care about CPU <laughs> uh, at this stage. Uh, the other problem we had is, as I mentioned, performance testing. Uh, we wanted to make sure that you know, our developers are able to deploy quickly and that you know, they're getting good results on the platform. So what we've done is we've built out some, some very simple sample application. Um, the idea behind the app is that you know, I have a data center and I have some service being made available in a data center. I have a Java Liberty, in this case, app, uh, which is going to make requests to the data center. And then I have a Node app, which is going to talk to the Java app, which is going to make requests from the data center. And all we are doing here is we're just connecting JMeter to that and saying, OK, let me you know, just get some static content right, and have, have that content come from here. And it's just going to pull it you know, with a bunch of calls here. And uh, today, a bunch of these calls are going through the Go router. right? So if you, if you think about Cloud Foundry and the, from the architecture point of view, you know, this connection to this will be going to the Go router. And this connection here will be going to our on-prem, and this connection also goes through the Go router, right? 
So there's a bunch of uh, connection hops. So one of the things we found is, you know, for this particular case, we picked a pretty good backend system, uh, and there was, you know, going at about 100 millisecond response times. So things were looking pretty good there. And believe it or not, all of our systems are able to give you 100 millisecond response times. <laughs> we do have some legacy systems, and those systems can take quite a while to respond. But we wanted to keep things simple in this particular use case and not actually you know, uh, show some of that data and not worry about caching and, and all of that good stuff. So we just simplified it. Um, and then uh, so measuring from Java app directly going to the back end, you can see the spread of 5 to 800 milliseconds now. Um, as you go up to the Node.js level, you have Node making a request to Java, which then goes back to the back end and comes all the way back. Now you're looking at five to seven seconds. That's pretty bad. So, and that's a pretty simple app, right? So we said, okay, well, yeah, definitely there's something wrong here. So where's the problem, right? Is it the hardware? Is it the network, platform, code? Like, what happened? And we did not, of course, you know, we did not want <laughs> this type of behavior once you have a more complex app, right? Things become very, very difficult to manage. So what we've done is we've worked with IBM. We kind of pulled together um, a more representative use case, and we provided that use case to IBM, uh, and they've been uh, looking at it and running some tests and running tweaks, et cetera, and we've been working hand-in-hand -hand on some of the best practices around this as well. So um, this is where I will pass the baton to Surya to talk about some of the solutions and uh, best practices. All right. Thank you, um, Alex. So as Alex mentioned, um, we have this healthcare application and uh, we have some challenges. Um, I can uh, classify them as three different things. Um, one is the application specific issue, like uh, as Alex mentioned, we're trying to actually go from a, a traditional uh, Java E application to a, a more cloud native BFF applications. So do we have any lessons learned from that point? And then the second point is about uh, the platform itself, Cloud Foundry itself as we are trying to scale. Um, do we have any kind of inherent issues within the Cloud Foundry, uh, or um, do we have any issues um, in the Cloud Platform where we have uh, multiple different layers, right? Um, so what we did, uh, we took uh, a representative application like the BFF backend for frontend uh, pattern, uh, because most of the applications that KP uses are based on the BFF. Um, you can see we have two different types, like you know, a two-layer, two-tier, and three-tier. Like you know, the node application calling a Java API, which in turn calls the SOR, um, systems of record. Uh, so you can see that there are two different types. So um, the different uh, network issues that we have within the thing. So basically, we wanted to see whether we have any latency issues, if at all those latency issues are actually coming from where. And then we also saw some long-tail latencies also. Um, with this. So let me start with the application first. Um, from uh, a BFF point of view, what we identified um, is actually a um, lo lot of these recommendations are applicable for not only just for uh, healthcare, for any other industry as well. Um, so from a, if when you look at the backend services, because uh, as Alex mentioned, we have um, the systems of uh, record uh, where these applications are actually accessing the backend. So um, when we are designing these applications, we need to take care of uh, the backend service latency because some of the cloud applications, when you have very high backend service latency, um, then some of the runtimes will misbehave. So you need to tweak and tune the runtimes. That is one of the things. Um, and then uh, when we talk about microservices, um, Again, the main value proposition of microservices is the uh, z-axis scalability. Uh, so we need to uh, make sure that you know, we are uh, uh, finding the, uh, the knee of the curve and actually you are scaling and we are sizing it uh, such a way that you know, we have um, those things built into your uh, um, application. Right? And then a topology also. So then we went into the Cloud Foundry itself. From a best practice perspective, Cloud Foundry, as you can see, 
um, we need to make sure that you know, Cloud Foundry, when you're using Go Router, right? You know, we we have to um, because every call, let's say you have BFF um, node calling Java API, another calling uh, the second Java API, all these calls will go back all the way to the firewall and then get into the data power and then gets into Go Router and then gets into the second instance. So there are lots of network. Um, uh, multiple um, hops that these uh, applications, these transactions will go through. Um, so those are some of the inherent design issues, but there are um, certain things that we have within Cloud Foundry, like the new features that we're actually driving. Uh, for instance, the go router keep alive. So starting 253, we have a keep alive upstream, um, upstream uh, channel keep alive is enabled for go router. Um, we need to uh, use that and why we need to use that and what exactly it will solve. Um, I'll show some data there. And then container to container. Like if you want to avoid all these kinds of network hops, uh, there is a new feature called container to container networking with the CNI plugin um, where an application uh, in turn can call another um, service uh, without going back all the way to the firewall and getting into those things. So that will help. And then another thing like uh, Alex mentioned about, um, okay, see, I'm almost saturating my uh, you know, Diego cells. Almost everything is saturating. What exactly is happening? There are two things that are happening there. Uh, one is the, um, the test environment. The second one is the production environment. Uh, the test environment is actually more impacted because there is constant um, uh, you know, pushes that are happening there. So each time you do a CF push, if it is Java application, um, you will see a significant spike because uh, the amount of droplet, the bigger the droplet size, the bigger the spike is going to be. So those are some of the things, and we have a new feature in the Cloud Foundry that is just just uh, in 279, I think it's the result. It, it's there in a OCI, that's called OCI layered file system. Basically, the, the, the build pack mechanism now uses um, a layered file system like Docker rather than a flat file system. So that will actually reduce these CPU spikes. So things like that, and you, you, you need to look into. And then um, there are other things like uh, the algorithm, the C group algorithm, how um, when you push an app, the algorithm doesn't take into consideration whether that particular cell um, has enough CPU left, because it's, the algorithm is based on the memory. So that also will have uh, an impact because the, your cell is completely full, um, uh, saturated from a CPU perspective, but still uh, the push will go to that cell and then that staging may fail. And some of those things um, we need to uh, take into consideration. So you can see here, and then uh, another uh, major issue that we saw uh, was the long tail latency. We saw uh, certain, uh, certain transactions, like you know, if you go 98th percentile to 99th percentile, they're almost like 10x difference, um, which is really bad uh, for microservices. Um, so resolving the long tail latencies is a really tough one. Um, but you know, we identified that uh, to be the good order keep alive. Once you enable that, then we resolve. We could resolve the long tail latency. So I suggest all of you to to take um, advantage of that uh, to eliminate the long tail latency. And you can clearly see the difference on the on the left hand side. Um, you can see that uh, that is without go router. On the right hand side, you can see with go router the difference in the latency just by enabling the uh, go router um, keep alive. Um, um, this is with uh, the BFF application uh, after enabling the, um, the Keep Alives for uh, Go Router. Uh, you can clearly see the difference between the 90th and 99th percentile is uh, much uh, lower there. Another thing that we found is the front door. Like, because you have a front door that, uh, you know, like the data power and other things that we have in front of the Go Router, um, if those front door areas, those layers are not tuned right, like for instance, data power is not tuned, then you can clearly see the significant jump in the latency. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see that uh, the one that misconfigured front door, uh, how much it's impacting uh, the, the overall latency of the uh, microservices. And this is what um, um, Alex was talking about, the spikes. Um, what we did, we did 
a temporary fix and a, and a long-term fix. Temporary fix is um, uh, we have doubled the capacity. We went from four vCPUs to eight vCPUs in a cell so that you don't need to, um, actually you won't be saturating and then you will have enough room, headroom, uh, so that you can actually get the uh, pushes uh, going through fine without any staging issues. Um, of course, the, the long-term fix is the OCI, um, so which will uh, tone that uh, CPU spikes down, right? And after applying all that, um, we can actually clearly see that now um, we have the, uh, uh, the healthcare microservice application performing and scaling, and as you can clearly see the knee of the curve, um, that's where one single instance of uh, this microservice application is actually hitting. Beyond that, of course, the only thing that will increase is the latency, so you get to uh, scale um, horizontally. So these are some of the lessons learned, and I will let um, um, Alex talk about some of the pain points that are from the um, Cloud Foundry uh, fabric itself right? That, that you have identified. Yeah, thanks. So um, one of the things we learned is that, I mean, doing active monitoring for things like CPU utilization is a good idea. And if you're working in the managed environment, you may not have a lot of visibility into those things. So you have to work with your provider to understand how you're going to manage that, right? So they may have a view into virtual machines and how they're running. You may not have access to that level. And if you don't have access to that level, then you better be talking to them about, okay, great, how do I you know, how do I get to that level? How, do, how am I going to know when I get to that barrier, right? So we've developed some code, some scripts, and we have some dashboards that now we're tracking how our applications behave. So we're trying to, you know, proactively look at those, those things and, and carefully analyze what's happening. Uh, the other thing we found is that it's interesting because teams will optimize for areas where you set quotas. So if you tell your team, hey, you guys, we're being charged by memory, and we have to optimize the memory. And if you know, you know, Cloud Foundry, a lot of quotas you can set based on memory. There's not a lot you can do based on network throughput or based on CPU utilization. So what you find is you find clever developers who say, oh, okay, if I have to make a trade-off between being more CPU intensive and lower memory versus being less CPU intensive and higher memory, guess where I'm going to go? So they're making these decisions, and in the end, that only makes the problem worse, right? So if you're not tracking it, it just gets worse. Um, the other thing is the performance testing becomes an interesting problem, an interesting challenge, because what happens is your teams basically can run performance tests one day, and you know, from, from the point of view of C groups, it will allow you to spike, right, for your CPU to spike. And you can actually, if you happen to be on the Diego cell, which is not very busy, you can use up more CPU on the Diego cell for a particular application. Now, what happens if you get on a busy Diego cell? Um, then you, d you only get whatever CPU shares are available for your application based on the amount of memory that is allocated, right? And so one of the challenges we've seen is, you know, depending on where your application lends and where your specific application instance lends, your performance testing may show some different results, right? In some cases, you may think everything is great. In other cases, you may think things aren't so great, right? So and you, you have to be careful about that and keep that in mind that there's some consistency here that ne you need to worry about. Um, and uh, a few other things in terms of uh, support for workload uh, rebalancing. So those are the things that we would you know, appreciate folks to weigh in from the community perspective and support for CPU quotas. So I think you know, there's a lot of talk in this conference about Kubernetes and you know, how Kubernetes will potentially you know, work with Cloud Foundry and maybe in the future be part of, you know, just a runtime for Cloud Foundry. I, I think those are all interesting conversations for us because, you know, we want to make sure that we understand, uh, you know, and, and can control some of the additional capabilities that uh, some of these additional resources that, you know, Kubernetes may be able to provide us with knobs to control better. So. Yeah, with that, um, there is one more session I have tomorrow, like around 3.45. Um, that talks about um, um, 
how you compare Cloud Foundry with Kubernetes. Um, and also, I think Don from IBM already announced uh, about the CFI, the IBM Cloud Foundry Enterprise Environment. So you will actually uh, get to see some of the uh, data from the CFI. And also, we'll talk about a little bit on, on Istio and uh, um, how Istio um, can be supported on Cloud Foundry, what's the future, and all that. Uh, we have a talk tomorrow at uh, 345. So with that, uh, any, any questions? I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. What did I? Monitoring. OK. Uh, the question is, what did we use for monitoring, uh, Alex? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So we're using, uh, for monitoring, we're using uh, Dynatrace. So we kind of, we have a, a lot of flexibility into what we can look into with Dynatrace. So that's kind of our product of choice right now. Yeah, uh, one is the Dynatrace, but also um, I think you have some custom. Uh, yeah, 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 of course. Uh, uh, there's also some custom scripts, basically, that we've written, as I mentioned. So basically, some of this stuff, because it's a platform, so we may not be able to install like agents on the VMs to actually get some of the data. So what we end up doing is uh, writing some scripts against the APIs and pulling the, the data for, that way, and basically then dumping that data into a store and then doing some analytics with dashboards on top of that. So that, that's the other that's the other way to integrate and and yeah. Right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, folks.